Well, I mean, listen, I think um, obviously uh, the economy and how we help Canada move into the next stage of dealing with post-pandemic recovery, um, continuing the work to bring inflation down, uh, making sure that Canadians feel like there is hope for their children in terms of uh, managing all the challenges that uh, the economy presents. but also climate change presents. I think it's going to be very helpful to have a perspective that's from outside of politics, um, that is someone that, you know, is esteemed in, in the space of uh, economic leadership. And I look forward to actually meeting him. Um, and if you're uh, to to you have some thoughts about this role because listen, it doesn't matter. They're basically the same person, Justin Trudeau and Mark Carney, and they espouse the same policies. So the same policies will his work is pretty Canadian. How do you show Canadians not just a new name attached to the party, but like a new sense of energy at a time where you're well, I think the difference, the profound difference between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party is that the Conservative Party believes and always has that they can cut their way to prosperity. But I can tell you in my community the kinds of investments that we've been making in people, in programs, in small business, in community organizations, in hardworking families struggling to get ahead, that's actually what matters and that's what creates prosperity. Of course it's been a challenging time economically, it has globally. You know, there's a, a post-pandemic recovery that uh, actually we're starting to see some relief from now, but there is a drastic difference between the conservative vision, which is to cut, 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 and essentially most of the time that affects the most impoverished in our community. And what we actually need is we need to be focused on ensuring that everyone has that fair chance to succeed. That's why I'm still a politician. I'm so sorry. On another issue, <laughs> you carry up the, the deal with the liberals. What, what do you make of it, and how do you feel about the uncertainty? You know, I think there's always some uncertainty unless you're in a majority government, but I would just say that uh, there's hard work to do ahead. And so as a member of parliament, as a cabinet minister, I have important legislation on the floor. Um, you know, the First Nations Water Act is currently in the House of Commons. It's disappointing that the NDP would play games with the lives of Indigenous people. That's a good example of uh, the uncertainty. Um, but for me, I stay focused on every opportunity I have to work with my colleagues across the line, a classy aisle to make sure that I can actually pursue and finish that legislation so that we don't ever find ourselves in the position that we do today with so many communities um, still, you know, struggling for certainty around water. One of your own caucus colleagues, Alexander Mendez, this morning said that if she were to listen to her constituents, it would be for him to tell Mr. Trudeau it's time to step down because that's what her own constituents have been telling her. Uh, what kind of message do you think that sends at a liberal caucus retreat where you guys are trying to reset everything? Uh, so well, you know, well, listen, I've spoken to many colleagues all across the spectrum of uh, colleagues who are some colleagues feeling extremely optimistic, extremely hopeful, um, and many colleagues who are running again. And I would just say that politics is a team sport and that we need to support each other. We need to support each other in tough times. We need to uh, support each other when we're trying to craft legislation. We need to support each other um, at meetings like this. And of course, it's normal to have challenging conversations, and I think that we should. But uh, I'll just say this. Um, uh, in, in, my, in the work that I've done this summer, I've been very focused on what the needs of my members of parliament are and how I can actually deliver for them, and that's how I'm going to keep doing the job. All right, it could be closer than ever to an election. We had one of your colleagues say, uh, Ms. Mendez is back, that people on the body are sending a clear message that the prime minister should not be prime minister anymore. How are you feeling coming to the party? I feel uh, good. I, I haven't seen my colleagues in in a few months. I'm looking forward to hearing what, uh, what what Canadians on the doorsteps are telling them. What what they want us to fight for. What are the important things to them? What are the things that we're going to move forward on? Uh, as, as far as elections go, I think the the BC NDP have their hands full uh, in in this province. I, I went to law school with David Eby. He's a he's a friend of mine, and I I, I think that the efforts, uh, if there's an election in the fall, should be focused on uh, British Columbia, and uh, we'll figure out our, our national politics. But we have so much more left to deliver. We have uh, we have to make sure that we get the dental care across the finish line, that we can get the national food program 
across the finish line. We've got all of these things that we're continuing to work for. Uh, and I think that Canadians want us to keep fighting for them and keep helping them out and showing that we care. Okay. Now we get to hear there's this sense like, okay, there's not going to be a big big crash, you're not going to necessarily have cabinet shuffle, Prime Minister said he wants to say, you know, Mark Carney is going to be on this leader's economic advisory board, but like, it's pretty low in the fall. Oh, how fast does he say to see? You want me to yell at them and tell Sophie the media hears everything you're saying? Okay. Patrick, the, 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 Patrick, the mic is going live out here, so everything that we're doing in there is being heard out here. Which may not be a great thing for... <laughs> uh, yeah. It starts with Rural Caucus. We're going to start, Rural Caucus is going to get us there and we're going to figure out, start off with cell service across Canada and move forward on that direction. Well, I think everyone uh, feels that there's something that we need to do. Everyone, but also feels that there, you know, when we look at what we've done for Canada and in Canada, I think that we're confident in our legacy shows that we've cared for Canadians. Okay. And so coming back from that, I, I know that everyone thinks that, uh, you know, no new leadership candidates or an election is, is the sexiest idea out there. But I think we have a year left to continue to deliver for Canadians. That's what I'm looking at in Cape Breton in, in terms of Sydney, Victoria, where I am, is saying, what can I do over the next year to, to maximize my time as a, as a member of parliament advocating for my people? Um, I understand a significant portion of Atlantic Caucus is not going to be very close to the Atlantic Caucus. There's something like seven MPs in the Atlantic that aren't making an appearance in the Nymo. Do you look surprised? I, I am surprised. I've heard some people are away because of uh, health issues that they could not, not make it here, but I haven't heard that uh, a, a lot of them from our conversations, which included the Prime Minister in uh, Newfoundland, I, my impression was that, that we're all coming here and we all have important things to advocate for for the Atlantic. I mean, I don't know. As, as liberals, what we want to show is that we govern from the center. What we continue to do is care for Canadians. What we continue to do is try to ensure that we're offering the supports that people need. Uh, we're, we're listening to seniors. We're listening to, to the youth. We're trying to do the things that we need to do, but also at the same time being focused on the economy. And we're seeing that the economy is, is, is taking a step in the right direction over the past few months. We were told this leading up to this year is that things might be a little bit uh, shaky for the first two years, but in the last two years, we were really going to make a, make a dramatic uh, improvement. And I think that's what we're seeing, is, is the economy being better. But let's be honest, all governments, uh, eventually, uh, people get tired of them, and, and they want something fresh. But uh, what we continue to do is know that we're delivering for Canadians. We have, we have tremendous confidence that the Prime Minister is still the best person we have in that room to lead us. I think with three election wins, he's earned the right to go out on his own terms. Uh, I always compare it to, to football as an old football coach. You don't bench the starting quarterback after winning three Super Bowls uh, in a row. So, you know, we continue to move that, uh, move in that way. And what we really just focus on is what is the next thing that Canadians want from us? And at some point, all governments pass the torch to another government. I don't know if that happens in a year or, or three years or however many years, but all we can do is focus on what Canadians are hearing, what, what they're asking from us, what are the biggest issues that Canadians are facing in our, in our areas, and how can we improve that for them and show that we're a government that's delivering. Yeah. 
I don't think that is at all. I think uh, as, as someone who's led us and someone who has inspired us and someone who took us from a fourth place party to governing in three consecutive elections, he knows how to fight, he knows how to win, and uh, I've always said he goes out on his own terms. So what do you need to hear from him? You know what? I heard from him uh, in June. We had a, a good face-to-face -face, uh, for, for an hour. We talked again in, in uh, last week in Newfoundland. There's nothing I need to hear from the Prime Minister that's going to change my opinion about him. I think he's the best that we have. I think he's, he's earned the right to go forward in another election if we're going to have it. Uh, I'm totally confident with, with his vision. The question is, in nine months or six months, whenever you know the de decision is made to go into an election or are, are Canadians gonna see him and say is that the person that they want and uh, we don't know that yet but uh, we never know what can happen we've seen I I'm not one of those persons who put a lot of uh, into the put a lot of faith into the polls if I would have followed the polls I've never would have won the nomination I never would have won an election I've never been picked to win anything by pollsters and yet here I am so uh, two elections later and we'll, you know, I, 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 I don't really uh, wake up every day and check where I am in, in, in the standings because they've been wrong every single time about me. And so if they can be wrong about me, they can be wrong about many others. Okay, so speaking of, speaking of polls, which you can like very much, they're not very good in the Atlantic province. But like I said, I don't pay attention to polls just now. It's not going well right now. Do you need to I will, and do you get that from where? From the polls, okay. I get my information from the grocery stores when I talk to people, when I go to places across my riding, when I go to the events, when I talk to people at the doors. I don't get that, uh, you know, that, that sense that uh, we're in trouble in the Atlantic. I think that the Atlantic has typically been uh, a, a progressive spot. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's one of those places that are, are kind of meat and potato, fisheries, uh, EI kind of folks that uh, are, that tell us how we th they think we're doing and from all indications that I've had, they don't reflect what the polls show. Looking at the local market, as I see you're in Sydney and Victoria, I'm from here to Lambo, don't kind of go right through Vancouver Island. I think you got the wrong Victoria. Pardon me? It's Sydney, Victoria and Cape Breton. So, okay, in, okay. in Nova Scotia. I, I just saw Victoria, so I apologize. Okay, okay. Um, then it makes my question a more relevant. Uh, I'm right here local. You talk about addressing local needs, addressing local needs for Canadians. You say you're taking care of it and you're listening to what people want. On Vancouver Island, and I'm most specifically, crime has been through the roof. We had someone down here with a machete threatening people. We have had businesses suffering back and forth with the drug crisis. We have had several people that I've spoken to, community groups, saying it's unaffordable to live here. Housing is ridiculous right now. We're paying, I'm paying for close to $2,000 for my apartment. How is that listening to what people have to say and how is that being addressed? Because quite frankly, people on Vancouver Island don't feel their needs are being addressed. And I think that's all levels of government. When you're talking about police enforcement, you're talking about those things. There's various levels of government that in intertwine that. So if you're telling me that's the, the mood from what you've heard, uh, I, I'll trust you on that. But that isn't what necessarily I've heard on the Atlantic. And I just really don't want to speculate on a, on a part of the country where I just flew into today and I'm from the entire opposite end of the country. Like, if you go as far east before you hit the ocean, that's my riding. And now I'm here on the other side. I, I can't reflect on your thoughts on what the, what people are saying at this point and saying uh, what's going. But I can say that you've got a provincial election going on. Uh, David Eby is someone that I went to law school. I have great respect for. Uh, he's a friend, and I and I hope him uh, the best of luck. And this is part of the election that we're going to be seeing in British Columbia is addressing some of those things that you're talking about. And uh, so I, I don't want to get a, in front of uh, my law school colleague and friend and say, here's what the federal government is saying about your back door. I respect. David and I think that uh, he's doing a wonderful job and I would never comment on anything in, in his election coming up that would show that the federal government seems to want to have a, a say in, in something that's uh, that's happening locally. Two, sorry, Richard, two, years, uh, two weeks ago I spoke to ATV and asked him the exact same question and he literally said this is a federal government issue and now you're telling me and we look forward to working with David E.B. once uh, the election is done. So, but the thing is, you're saying it's federal, he's saying it's provincial. Um, which part of it? Which part of which? So you mentioned about seven different things there. You started off with police enforcement. Federal issue. Okay. Housing is going to become a federal issue because of the immigration. 
Yes, and we and we will look forward to working with David Eby after the election to make sure that we address these uh, in a way that I think that progressive governments usually do. I just want to ask you about the nomination of the party. And there is a special vibe behind it. I haven't heard that news. I, I saw Mark uh, at the airport. I was very happy to see him here. I've always respected uh, the, what what he stated and uh, and his intelligence, and I look forward to hearing from him. Uh, in terms of any position he currently holds with the party, we haven't been made uh, aware of anything uh, uh, that you're saying. <laughs> Interesting. I look forward to hearing that that uh, vision. What do you think about Mr. Carney and him having that type of role within the party? I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Carney. Oh, we're all, you know. There's always good ideas out there, and better is always possible. The prime minister says, and you know, I think it shows uh, a great deal of uh, comfort that uh, that that he's here, and that we're going to hear his vision as well. And uh, you know, we've listened to him on forums. I know he was in Ottawa during during the sustainable finance forum that my colleague Ryan Turnbull put on. Uh, I, I enjoyed listening to him then, and I'm uh, really going to enjoy hearing him out on this one. And I think this is what this is about. Like, we spend the summer, we listen to Canadians, we go back to our constituency, we talk to our families about what's going on, and then we come here from all the different parts of Canada and say, here's what we heard, here's the problems that we're hearing in BC, here's the problem that we're hearing in Atlantic Canada, here's the problems that we're hearing with Indigenous communities, I'm the chair of Indigenous Caucus. You know, we all have a role in, in terms of coming here and setting that new agenda. So we don't expect to come here and just have a, 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 a plan laid out for us. We want to be part of the plan and that's why this the caucuses are important when you meet with Atlantic caucus to talk to the Prime Minister when you meet with national caucus we just come here and we look at, as a collective how do we make lives better for Canadians I think we're already excited every day we wake up every day I wake up in Ottawa, and I go to the House of Commons as the first Mi'kmaq, whoever's who to do this. I'm the first First Nation. I'm one of the only First Nations in this country who actually lives on a First Nations reserve, who gets to go in there and make laws. I'm excited every single day I get go to work because the the fact is there's only been a handful of First Nations who live on a reserve who've ever served as a member of Parliament. So when I get, wake up and go to Ottawa, I'm excited for the, that chance and that ability to do that. And so uh, whether you know it's it's the Prime Minister, whether it's some other speaker who comes in and talks about great new ideas, I'm always excited to hear that, but I'm always excited and feel privileged for the role I have. Well, I think that the, the comfort is and that we're always re reaching out to hear new ideas. I mean, you know, some, sometimes uh, the things that we talk about that, because it's the same MPs and the same ridings, we kind of get tunnel vision on what's important in our ridings and in our areas or to our, uh, like with Indigenous Caucus, I tend to, you know, focus on, on that. But, you know, when you have new people coming in who aren't necessarily elected, it's getting a fresh opinion, fresh ideas that aren't um, based on three years of listening to uh, the MPs that we have in this caucus and you know I think it's uh, kind of refreshing and like to hear like to see more of it and it's, it's comforting to know that we do have a prime minister who's not uh, intimidated by everyone you know trying to say that you know we're, we're looking for a replacement from him, that he can say I'm I'm, I'm I'm happy to hear from new ideas I, I wouldn't say that that's something I hear from my constituents. I'd say it's uh, being a former professor of political science. You look and, and say, you know, 10 years, 8 years, 12 years. People tend to, to, to see that as, uh, you know, they start tuning out a government. And so we have to come up with fresh ideas that uh, shows to Canadians that we're still here, we're still listening, and we have more to, more to do and more to offer. And that's, and that's a challenge because, you know, what, 
in any relationship in life. Could it be a marriage that these typically end after five years or, or a government or anything like that? You're always looking at the grass is greener, something else comes up, something, there's a new fresh idea, a new fresh face, and you're always competing with whatever's new out there, competitor, competitor, competing against what's been there for you, what got you through, and, and what will be there for you. And what we hope to show Canadians is that we're the government that got them through the pandemic, we're the government that got them through many uh, different challenges that we've had over the past, what are we at? I mean, I'm at five years, so they're at nine years, uh, and that we show that we're still listening, we're still there, and we're still fighting for them, we still care about them. Okay. Bon après-midi, tout le monde. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay. Okay, so it's like between 12 and 15 uh, people that, that can't make it, and that's normal. Every year there's a certain number of people, whether it's, you know, they have uh, international travel or illness or a family situation. So it's well within the norm, and uh, I'm fully expecting everybody. What, what, what can you tell us about the game plan? I mean, what we've been hearing is sort of a bit of a steady as she goes, listening to Canadians. Do you think maybe you find yourself in the precipice of an election right now? Like, how much do you need? Well, there's nothing like the threat of an election to focus the minds, right? So this caucus is unified around that objective. How do we win an, the next election for Canadians? Because Canadians are counting on us to do so. Well, okay. So I'm, I'm as, as uh, you know, chair of the National Caucus, my role, because I'm an MP as well, my role is to make sure that the, the National Caucus is a vehicle for all MPs to have their voices heard. That is really the key thing that, that we do, and that we can do that within this, you know, sort of confidential uh, 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 medium of exchange uh, uh, amongst ourselves, but also speaking to our leadership. So those are the conversations that we're going to be having, and my job is to make sure that they do have Mais, mais c'est sûr qu'il y a toutes sortes d'opinions, de, 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 c'est justement ça qu'on entend, euh, parce qu'on on, on avait des caucus régionaux, n'est-ce pas, euh, cet été, et, et des, des conversations continuelles. Puis moi, personnellement, j'ai fait des portes dernièrement à la salle Villemarde euh, euh, Verdun, et, et c'est très intéressant. Euh, euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on entend à la porte, c'est vraiment les enjeux, euh, ce sont vraiment des enjeux d'abordabilité, puis euh, euh, comment les, les familles, euh, les, les, les aînés, euh, les gens euh, font face euh, aux enjeux aujourd'hui. Donc, c'est sûr que j'amène ça, euh, comme tous mes collègues, euh, euh, de retour. C'est important pour nous de, de discuter de ces choses-là, qui ce sont des priorités des Canadiens et Canadiennes. Mais en fait, il y a toujours dans, on parle de la parapluie, n'est-ce pas, ou la tente, la grande tente libérale, parce que moi-même, je suis un libéral bleu, là, si vous voulez, mais dans le sens que je veux quand même, c'est plus par rapport euh, les programmes qu'on qu a mis en place, comme les soins dentaires, là, de, de, les gens chez, chez moi, moi je suis la députée de Châteauguay-la-Colle, bientôt Châteauguay-les-Jardins de Napieuville, on, on a eu notre changement de nom, et, et euh, parce que ça reflète justement la réalité chez moi, c'est moitié urbaine, moitié rurale, et les gens chez nous, pour les soins dentaires, pour euh, tout ce qu'il y a des, des, des programmes d'abordabilité, de c'est très important qu'on est capable de... Euh, continuer ces programmes, n'est-ce pas? Donc, quand on parle des dépenses, ce n'est pas juste couper des dépenses là, sans, sans regarder quest ce que ça va faire. C'est vraiment la gestion, n'est-ce pas? Donc, ça, ça, ça fait partie de la conversation. Pour moi, personnellement. Là. Puis, puis c'est sûr qu'il y en a... J'ai d'autres collègues là, qui amènent oh, les mêmes points. You, you know, staff turnover, like, that's a normal thing. Like, I come from a business background, and that's a, a totally normal thing, and it has to happen, and it, it certainly happens at, at all levels. And so, for me, it's really um, 
you know, people come on board that are that are uh, that, that that share the vision, that want to move forward. And my job, again, as the chair of national caucus, is to make sure that the MPs themselves have access to all those resources and abilities to, um, uh, you know, to continue to to, to move forward. Well, I'll start with Mr. Carney because, you know, I've read his book and uh, certainly followed his career uh, and, uh, you know, this is someone with a very impressive uh, professional background and so I am looking forward to hearing what he has to say, definitely. Uh, uh, for my friends uh, in the Bloc Québécois, and I have friends, uh, obviously I'm a Quebecer, uh, we share a lot of the same issues and if we can work together, let's work together. But uh, at the end of the day, we're Liberals. Thank you. <laughs> la nomination de M. Carney, est-ce que c'est une façon de, de vous démontrer qu'il y a un certain renouveau? Est-ce qu'il y a ce désir-là de montrer de nouvelles choses au Canada, une nouvelle image de ce renouveau? C'est sûr que euh, M. Carney, c'est un libéral, c'est quelqu'un qui a déjà euh, parlé à notre euh, euh, parti politique, là. il est déjà un, un conférencier euh, lors de nos congrès, donc c'est quelqu'un qui a quelque chose à, à, à dire, à partager, puis euh, donc euh, il n'y a rien de nouveau dans ça, c'est juste que là il va prendre, et, et, et ce n'est pas de mon, euh, de mon égard, là, on peut dire ça, mais ce n'est pas moi qui ai fait ces décisions-là, mais comme euh, membre de caucus, et comme président, ça m'intéresse beaucoup là d'entendre qu'est-ce qu'il y a à dire. Donc je pense que I think that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.